Hello, my fellow Brodies and Pegasus sisters. Welcome to the NBS show. It's time to get out the sleeping mats and uncurk the hair dryers. We're talking sleepovers. But hark, what's that I smell in the air? Could it be anger? Fury? Could it be Sapphire Heart Song reacting to the artwork? No me gusta! Yes, one of my co-hosts, our little mascot, Silver Qu- Silver Quills buddy, Sapphire Heart Song. No one my- put Safi in the corner. No one put Safi in the corner. Noted. And my other buddy, Norman Sanzo, Planeswalker Extraordinaire and Podcaster. This Siwama is fabulous! No, it's all- no, go to the corner. <laughs> I can't be put in the corner, but you can. Go. If we did this in a circular room, would your mind break? There are no corners with which to banish? I would kick him up from the ceiling and make him stay there. Or stick him to the ceiling, then. Mm, I'm having this image of Norman just his head implanted in the ceiling. is just dangling there. Little legs kicking. It's it's quite terrifying to imagine. Uh, no fun. No fun. But we're hopefully going to have some fun talking about My Little Pony Friends Forever, issue number 28. Written by Jeremy Wheatley, with art by Jay Foskett, and colors by Heather Breckel. Mm-hmm. Star- starring of all ponies, the cutie Mark Crusaders and Princess Luna. Yay! More Luna! And as the cover says, now with more cutie marks. This marks the first issue where the uh, cutie Mark Crusaders have their marks. And gotta give credit, it took at least half a year or more for Alicorn Twilight to make her way into the comics. <laughs> yeah, and this what this is kind of speedy. Yeah, this is, they knew it was coming, I think. Mm-hmm. So, as we, we will be going through this scene by scene as we talk about the various ups and downs and ins and outs. But before that, I think we should take a look at the big picture. Norman, what did you think of this here comic? Hmm. This comic feels kind of a rehash, but from another different character's point of view. It's like the CMC is getting bullied before, but now it's just with another pony. And, well... It does go for the fact that Luna is insecure about her, what you call this, about herself and how she still thinks that kids are afraid of her. And the CMC knows that it's not true because she's really kind hearted and the CMCs are trying to help her while at the same time helping another the pony with something. So this is pretty interesting. I kind of like this comic when I read it. It had that feel good story at the end. Mm. There you go. And, Sapphire Hartsong, what do you think of this? The artwork sucks. I hate you, Jay Foskett. Get out of my life, my longtime enemy who has no idea who I am. Oh, yeah, other than that, eh, the story's okay. I still think the, um... I still believe the ending villain of this comic is a bit shoehorned in. I don't really have much to say or complain about other than the friggin' artwork! We'll have plenty to talk about when we get to the, when we get to the semi-villain. I'm not even sure I can call it a villain. Now, as for myself, Foskett's style is not my favorite. But when people say it's disproportionate, that's assuming the ponies in this show are disproportionate. Their heads are huge. Their eyes are huge. Their eyes are huge. But the thing is that he's consistent in his proportions. It's just that they're exaggerated. And the thing is, with Fosgate's style, it's his style. And if Hasbro or the IDW didn't like it, they could have said, thank you, but you're a one-shot guy, so we'll leave you away. Remember the micro, Twilight Micro? Yeah, that was a one-shot. I'm not What's saying, like, I don't like Fosgate's style, but I don't know. It just doesn't sit well with me in a My Little Pony comic, of all things. Especially since, well, he doesn't usually care. That's what I have against Foskett. Well, thankfully, there's no, there's no, uh, egg whisk clip art in this episode, in this issue. I don't know. People are kind of hard on him because of that and a lot of other things like the style. Like, the thing is, he's not doing the same mistake again. He's not uh, using clip art. He's using everything to account with the castle. Nobody really sees how the castle inside looks like. So, to me, he's doing a good job. So why the hate? Why? Because we're fans, and fans love to destroy that which they celebrate. It is a dark duality of the spirit. Or we're just really picky. Yeah, I mean, yeah. picky, like, for no good reason. <laughs> Honestly, his style may be different, but I don't see why the hate. 
Well, in this case, with Foskett's artwork, for me, it's more that the ponies tend to assume very human bipedal stances. I think that's because Jay Foskett is more used to that. Drawing ponies is probably a very different experience. So that slips in every now and again. Story-wise, I enjoyed this comic. I enjoyed seeing the CMC really applying their love of guiding others for cutie marks and reaching out to Princess Luna. Luna remains sort of a character at times. This awkward, out-of-place princess who, ironically, being the most non-traditional princess, is the one who insists the most on tradition and diction and decorum. So there's still a lot of fun together. And honestly, this Luna is the TV Luna, the safe Luna. Because we all here, as far as I know, is a big fan of the Katie Cook's version of Luna. The insane Luna who's willing to go above and beyond just to have fun. Even wrestle a bear. So I think we can agree that we love that Luna. No? Luna is a lot of... Oh, I love Luna in all her forms. Yeah. I'm a Luna fan by Luna! Luna, <laughs> Luna, Luna, Yeah. But still... Uh, I... You were also my fanboy at one point. In an yes. alternate universe. Yes, when you break the universe, we'll talk. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anywho, folks at home, consider yourselves warned. First impressions have been given, but now we're going to spoil your rotten. Yep, yep. So... Are we all set to launch into this? Do I hear I, a yay, yes. or a nay? Aye, aye, Captain. Aye. Nay. Well, that's two, four, and one against. Hail democracy. <laughs> yay. So we begin outside Canterlot, where the ponies are get well, the fillies are gathering for a royal sleepover. This is one of the funnier things that Celestia says. We want to do this because these are the future leaders of Equestria. In the back of my mind... I'm thinking, well, what about all the Colts? Are they going to lead anything? (laughs) 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 Oh, man, come on. Last week's episode, we had Zephyr on. So it's like... (laughs) (laughs) No. Uh, No, they'll they'll be doing the traditionally girly jobs. In a a role reversal to show that the strive for equality is really about just discriminating in a good way, uh, they'll they'll be lucky if they can marry into power. In case you guys haven't noticed, I don't think that's very progressive. Mm. But basically, we're going to focus on the Kima Crusaders at first, who are wondering if a knight in the castle will be anything like Harriet Pinto. But I don't well, get why she needs a wand when she already has magical powers, so though, like this character. I mean, I know it's supposed to be Harry Potter, but does she really need the wand? The outfit alone would be just fine. That's a magical cattle prod, actually. <laughs> Ah, uh, that's gonna hurt. Meanwhile, it's a Twilight... magical pointy stick. <laughs> Meanwhile, Twilight tries to uh, talk the CMC down, saying, "No, there there are no adventures in this castle. No great secrets, except for this time and this time and this time." And just as she's about to gain true awareness of her station, she's got to go beyond the fourth wall. We hear a cry of doom, and it turns out it's Celestia. Are you sure, Luna? No, it's Celestia, because we, we see Luna rushing to Celestia's aid. And it's because, and this will trigger me, <laughs> I'm about to be triggered. Oh, God. She left the Griffins and Yaks at a diplomatic event to hammer out the details. Now they're about to go to war. I thought it was because of the, uh, what is it, Buffalo Ball that they were playing in the last comic that Jay Foskett worked on? Celestia has been working to forge an alliance between the two. And they just so strongly disagreed in the span of a day that they're about to go to war. To no, war. Griffins, why? The hacks no, no. can go do whatever, but no, not the Griffins. I'm sorry. At this point, let natural selection take its course. Survival of the fittest and all that whatnot. Yeah, really. Let the Griffins take down the axe. I'd I'd be just fine with that, actually. I no, I should not. You had to put friendship in the line or some crap, Celestia. Why? I mean, I should not be hungry to hear that one species is about to get wiped out or dominated. But here we are, and I apologize for nothing. Silver, I think your bloodless is showing. Well, maybe. But meanwhile, we have Luna on hand to point out the severe pointlessness of sleepovers, which do not involve sleep. Well, 
Well, you have to think about it because Luna is the master of sleep and her realm is the realm of dreams. So having, well, ponies sleep at the castle but not sleep, what's the point? My power is useless. Although Celestia makes a point that for a lot of the youth, she and Luna are just legends, these distant figures. A lot of Celestia's work in the comics has been to break down that distance, like the uh, the Pinkie Pie and, Cel- and Luna micro. It was all about sort of a, a, a press conference to have fun, to make them seem more natural. Now, again, I question, why is Celestia only interested in breaking down that barrier with the Phillies? This is kind of messed up. Well, we've... If you remember, in the Luna and Pinkie Pie comic, that was not for the kids. That was more for the adults to show that um, the princesses, like even Celestia, is just another humble pony. It's just like a regular show schmo. In uh, the Celestia micro, it shows her as, well, she's trying to show that she's just another regular pony for the kids. And in this one, it's just showing that you can be here one day too i don't know i do notice that like you mentioned that and i do see that in the comics well with the celestia micro that was more showing how much she cares especially for some individuals like her teacher we've had celestia reaching out to the adults we've had her reaching out to the phillies but there really aren't even enough cults in equestria at least named ones that i made a comic based on this where I said, oh, they, the Colts were probably with shining armor and they've all been abducted. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that... I actually remember that comic. Wasn't it also, like, when you were reviewing this issue on Equestria Daily? Yep. <laughs> that explains it. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, so here I am on my high horse, but Celestia has the idea that without, if she can't do it, then Luna shall host the sleepover. Huzzah! Of which Luna is immediately replying, no, 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 no. Five no's. In fact, Luna has the view, she says this flat out in a panel, Phillies do not love me, they love the bright, shiny, sunshine princess. They find me frightening. And then ironically, in the very next page, Princess Luna! (laughs) Uh, Basically the brony fandom in a nutshell. (laughs) Yes. One of them is rearing up with her mouth open, I think she wants to consume the princesses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but let's just see um what the line is. Um I just relate to you so strongly. My sister is a goody horseshoe horseshoes too. <laughs> uh, Princess Luna, are you going are, are you coming over to the sleepover? You actually my favorite princess. <laughs> oh god. Yeah, yeah. Meanwhile Cel- Celestia is just dying a little on the inside. <laughs> no, I think she's happy for this because No, she's like, uh huh. Told you so. Yep, that, and also I think she's happy for this because, um, this is what she, this is what Luna always wanted a thousand years ago because of, remember way back when, when nobody really appreciates Luna's night and whatnot? Yeah, mm-hmm. this one is kind of the Luna, I'm happy for you because you got fanboys and fangirls. I'm dying on the inside for the lack of attention now, but I'm happy for you <laughs> and that I was right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, Twilight, to her credit, offers to stay and help, but now Luna's pride comes in. Mm-hmm. If if Celestia wasn't going to have help from Twilight, she will not have help from Twilight either. Whatever the form, there's still that competitiveness between Celestia and Luna, <laughs> although it seems to be one way. Yeah. I think um, Luna still needs a thousand years of maturity on her shoulders. And meanwhile, while the Crusaders sort of debate how Celeste is handling, we get a background shot of who will be semi-significant characters. Thestra and her two bullies. One of whom has murder eyes. I really feel bad for this one character. Like, I've... Yeah, you kind of knows her from the beginning, like, being stared down by two ponies who God knows what they're plotting. I can just tell from, you know, the looks on their faces upon this innocent little pony... I'm not going to like you guys, aren't I? Yep. Oh, no. And, and credit words, too. Foskett does give Thestra very sad eyes, so you just know she's feeling afraid. Okay, I'll give credit here. 
So basically the Crusaders become Luna's unofficial coaches as she's sweating the details. And we are treated to a two-page spread as we see, well, really only six Phillies participating. The rest kind of disappear. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I think the only reason why for this spread is two things. To show Luna in her glorious pose and the other is to show the CMCs having a good time and uh, who was there now? Trestra was it? Uh, Thestra. Or Th- Thestria? I'll have to double check. Yeah, but showing her she's not having a good time and the two bullies are bullying her. And why are they hanging out? <laughs> well, I, think I, I don't know. I think they're just sort of like trying to harass her. Like they won't leave her alone and she's just too afraid to speak up about it. Like, hey, could you guys go away? No, but the thing is, the thing is, these three knows each other. They're from the same town. It's like the CMCs, but except with Diamond Tiara, Silver Spoon, and Apple Bloom. What? Yeah, it's pretty messed up. Except, well, Diamond Tiara will go for, like, well, she'll go for, like, name-calling, but she won't, like, um, try to do, uh, you know, she won't try to assault Apple Bloom, as far as I'm concerned. That's what you think. Okay, maybe she would, but I don't remember a time where, like, Diamond Tiara has assaulted Apple Bloom, like, alone. Well, different kind of bully, different method, but still, it's the same thing. If you think about it, why is Sestra here in the same group with these two bullies? Like, it doesn't make sense in the sense of, why are you hanging out with them? Well, in some cases, especially for for introverted or shy souls... If you're in a room full of unknowns, even the bullies may be more familiar. Plus, they might be pursuing her, actively seeking her out. That and the thing is, I'm thinking, okay, here's me with logical sense of thinking going, why is she there in the first place? Why are those two keep aiming her? Why is she not reporting this to an adult? And why is she there in the first place? Why is she there? I likely imagine her parents kind of pushed her to get, go outside her comfort zone. And maybe because she too wanted to see the princesses. Why the bullies are doing that? This is what sociopaths do. They seek out victims because that's the only way to validate themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To feel like they have the power. And unfortunately, yes, you can feel sort of powerless in these situations where even asking for help won't cut it. I mean, what usually, usually parents give some pep talk about, uh, grow thicker skin or toughen up. Yeah. And this is one of those cases where us as adults can take it because we've lived it and we, <laughs> well, if we don't like it, we can always do something about it. But as for kids, it's a tough lesson to learn. And even I don't know what to say to my youngins if they are in this in position, if they're in this position. Well. As we move on, because we're about to see Thestra's breaking point, after they do some very odd tightrope walk, where they where the two girls basically do physically assault and shove her off, Luna departs briefly to get a book for everyone. And this is where Foskett's style makes me scratch my head. Her her horseshoes mm. or royal slippers, they're coming up halfway up her legs like socks. Yeah, but I I think this could be socks because the royal sleepover probably that's why that's my head cannon here. Uh no, it, it's not shown that way in all the other comics. I don't believe. Yeah, I know, but it's one of those cases where I have to agree with the haters that this is not a good job here. You mess up. Meanwhile, while Luna's away, the two uh, the two bullies go after Thestra, and she finally just runs off. She just can't handle this anymore. And the Crusaders uh, finally step up for their friend. But this is where I my criticism start coming back to Celestia. Because once Luna knows that Thestra is out there alone, she says parts of the castle are dangerous and full of dark magics at night. Why would you invite Phillies to come over to your castle that's filled with dark magic and menace? Because they have a Princess Luna to protect them. They also have royal guards who I notice are not present or keeping an eye on things. Silver, they're kidnapped. Great. So now <laughs> now Luna's got to save a filly and the entire royal guard. 
Yeah, along with Big Mac, um, Shining Armor, um, Flash Sentry. Who else? Who else are we missing? Except for Breeze. Except for Rebel- Breeze doesn't do crap. Do you think he'll do anything in this comic? Well, anywho, L- Luna gets un- uh, unexpected company with the three Crusaders going along with them. But they basically say that this is a cutie mark problem. Everyone says that Thestra is weird because of her talent, because of her cutie mark. And so the Crusaders are like, hey, that's our specialty. We'll help you. And basically they are about to follow the sound of a beast when they find out that it's Thestra really showing she gets proper hydration. (laughs) Yeah. She's crying a storm. And this is what I like about Fosgit's art. When Ophelia cries, you, you, you feel it. Remember in the Rainbow Dash and Spitfire comic? Yeah. Remember when all those feelies start crying? Like, it, I, I feel it. And here, I feel it too. So, he knows what he's doing. Well, he, he certainly knows how to show a crying filly. Although, Luna's wing shield, suddenly her wing is b- as big as herself and three fillies. I, I got no explanation for that one. Uh, she used the same spell as Trixie used on Rainbow that one time. Yep. So, and Luna is a fish out of water and comforting a crying filly. She doesn't really know how to handle this. Also, I, I swear her gloves are growing. In the panel where she whispers, be warmed, she is unpleasantly moist. By all that understood. Yeah, I, flashback I, I, material. Th- those, those gloves are just inching their way. Yeah, this is not, <laughs> this, I have to say that, yeah, the heaters have ammo for Foskit here. Like, I don't really mind. It's one of those situations where derp, don't really mind it. It doesn't really deter towards the story. It's distracting, but it doesn't really deter from the whole story. Yeah. Actually, I, I do empathize with Luna. Uh, at BronyCon, a fan said hello to me, but she started to burst into tears. Oh? Apparently getting well? to, well, a lot of people just weep on the side of me, but. <laughs> Apparently, this was just really exciting and emotional, and she was sort of breaking in tears. And I was, I was standing there dumbfounded. I was like, "What? Am, what am I supposed to do here? What's what's appropriate?" I had, yeah. and so <laughs> thankfully, I had lightning bliss and Mrs. Wolf on hand to say, "Go hug her." <laughs> I I don't think I was there for this. No, this I mean, was early I know on. When we first finally got here. I was overwhelmed and overjoyed with the excitement. I was tackle hugging everybody, but I I can understand like meeting you for the first time and actually <laughs> crying. Yeah, I mean, it's the, the the fact of the matter is like each and every one of us are special in our own ways. Like you, Silver, are popular because well, you do a show that everybody likes. Sapphire, you too. As for me, I got no idea why people are afraid of me. <laughs> I'm not afraid of you, but you host the ZMBS show. You brought us all together. Not true, that true, that. Yeah. So people meeting us, they're excited, they're nervous, and well, <laughs> honestly, we're just humans like you or anybody else. I, I actually can recall actually first meeting Silver and being like, ah, ah, please kill me. I'm sorry. I'm weird and awkward. Hi. Have you really met me? I'm weirder and more awkward than you. Really? Of course. No, I mean like when we first like met, it's like, hi, I, I. Ah, 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 ah. Still- Still awkward, but uh, we're we're going off topic. I'm not in this comic, though I might ask why not. But I empathize with Luna's discomfort, and we get shortly get uh, an explanation of Thestra's history that she got her cutie mark a mere weeks ago, didn't know what it meant, and once she did figure it out, she was very unhappy. Yeah, I mean the trouble shoes got nothing on this girl. <laughs> oh yeah, and her powers like. Oh my goodness, her powers are scary. We'll talk about it when we get to that part, which is pretty soon. Pretty soon, because the Crusaders lend a sympathetic ear mm-hmm. and stress that no one should make fun of you for your cutie mark. But that's just not really sold on on what this could mean. Oh, and he, and here's where we get to the most controversial part of the comic. This this is like WTF, mate. <laughs> Yeah. As as the Mira Orca comes into play and just stands there. Oh, this is a threat, but it's just floating there. We need to kill it now. Yeah. L- the Mira Orca, Mir Mira Orca? 
Yeah, Mirorca. It Luna tells us it's a creature of chaos magic, huge and terrifying and invulnerable to even alicorn magic. Well, huge, it's definitely bigger than a pony. It's really, it still fits inside the castle. I just put it more as sort of extra large. It's like a bus. It's like a bus size. And terrifying, I think it looks kind of cute. Mm, true that. But you have to remember, it's chaotic magic, so we got no idea what it could be or what it could yeah, do. Yeah, but it's not doing anything. It's just that, sitting there floating up in the air. It's not even sense. attacking. And it's uh, it's not hurting anybody. If anything, the damage to the castle is Luna shoots at it, and it automatically reflects the magic. So really, Luna's damaging her own stuff. <laughs> oh, true that. Yep. It's like that 90s Godzilla movie. You did more damage than the big creature! <laughs> so, basically, we learn what Thestra's magic is. And we also get treated to one of the freaky deaky images you'll ever see. <laughs> yep. A family picture. Ain't no sin to take off your skin and dance around in your bones. <laughs> but that's basically Thestra's power. You base She's a mobile x-ray machine. Yeah, that is freaky. And, and the thing is... It's not really an X-ray machine. Like it literally removes everything, and only the, what you're left is with the bones. Well, no, it doesn't oh. remove. It just makes them invisible. Really invisible? Yeah. Because all right, okay. Right. Applebloom says, "Thestra, is this your magic?" Yeah, my spell makes skin and muscle see through. They're not gone, but you can see the bone. Hmm. And Scootaloo, of course, is finding this super awesome. <laughs> All right, my bad then. But still, this is freaky. Like, Deadpool would really appreciate this kind of level. It'd be something. This girl would be all the rage on Nightmare Night. Oh, yeah, true that. Like, just think about it. But then, again, the Miraka is just floating there. And Luda's all like, I will kill you now! I must taste blood! This is what we like to do to the griffins and the yaks. <laughs> okay, honestly, I, I got no excuse for this. Why, why would Luna do it? Like, probably there's logical reasons. If we go to the bestiary, probably we'll see something, but nah. I'm sorry, I'm going by what I see, and what I see is a creature just floating there. A serene being in existence, mildly floating. The, the currents have led him to this beautiful place. Oh, God, why are you killing me? Oh, why? Oh, it hurts. Oh, oh, tell my wife a dozen children. I love them. Why does this happen to me? Don't, don't, please. And Thestra is a heroine of the day because they've killed. (laughs) For all their talk of friendship, ponies love to taste blood. (laughs) Friendship is magic. Now let me beat you down to a pulp. Uh, honestly, if listeners out there knows about the uh, Miorca, if it's real or anything like that, please tell us what that is really do because I would like to know. I I'm ninety percent sure the Miorca is a unique creation for the this comic, and it is now a more endangered species. <laughs> no, I I think it's extinct because with the comic verse, it usually comes up once. <laughs> Uh, ain't that a, ain't that a kick in the teeth? <laughs> I'm growing to realize this more and more. I mean, we will likely never see Thestra again. Oh, yeah. Nor the Mirorca. Thankfully, we won't see those two bullies, but they, they're awful, so don't care. Not true that. But kind of miss the prospect of coming back to ideas. Oh, yeah. And I think that probably some background characters do come back. Like, I do hope that we get to see, um, Mira. The female dragon from, uh, what's that? Manhattan? The, the Luna spike. Funny how either Luna or Pinky seem to get the really high, high discussion comics. Oh yeah, true that. Well still, that character I would like to see more. Ah, well. Luna, Pinky, and Spike. Yes. But yes, basically, Thestra is the celebrated heroine. And so the Crusaders show they're really intelligent, I think. By coming up with a list of all the ways Thestra's talents can be applied. Now that's, that's smart. That's showing that these characters are very intelligent. Yeah. And well, the CMC's, um, talent is to help cue team up problems. And since Thestra here has problems with her own abilities, having, well, the CMC's help her out a bit seems to do the job. So yay. 
And we also get to see Thestra's parents, who one is a unicorn and one is an earth pony. And I don't see a lot of inter-tribe marriage. And also a banana peel and a pear. So are they the Fruits Basket family? <laughs> I don't know. If you look at the male pony there, he's like... I, he's oh. probably not. I'm meeting a princess. <laughs> oh god, this reminds me of Friendship is Magic 40 where Twilight's dad is like, yay, photo op. Photo op. My daughter's being driven into a nervous breakdown. Thanks, Celestia. But I get to take a picture with the princess. Yay. Oh my. And meanwhile, we Celestia, uh, Luna is writing a letter to Celestia expressing that now she understands that as a creature who's felt a little out of place in the world, Kevin kind of outcast, she can be a beacon for those who feel likewise. Uh-huh. And that gives her a sense of purpose and pride. And that's good. Like you say, she needs a little thousand more years maturity. This is the step towards realizing the impact she can have on others. Yep. And so we come to the end. It's There's no comeuppance for the bullies, but actually this is kind of awkward given the most recent episode. Scootaloo comes up with a list of pranks that Thestra can uh, play on those mean girls. Yeah. Yeah. You could probably drive them to an early grave. <laughs> yeah. You know, I wouldn't blame them in this case because the difference between that episode and this comic is that Rainbow Dash deserved her comeuppance. And she was the one pranking them. While these bullies kind of do deserve their comeuppance for all the crap that they did to Thestra. They deserve the pranks. The other people in the show that got pranked don't. But still, I, I do not agree. Re- revenge is not the solution. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Embrace the bloodlust. <laughs> Trust me, I've no. been there and it's not good. They're neither griffins nor yaks, so I really can't can't call for bloodlust. Okay, leave the griffins alone. The griffins are the best thing ever. Shush. You're part griffin! So yes. Yeah. Ergo, I'm part jerk. <laughs> and we still love you anyway. And you just, y'all love me for my rump. Yeah. <laughs> that plot. Oh, dang. But, anywho, we've, re- we've reached the end. Mm-hmm. Funny enough, it does, it's not really a farewell between Luna and the Crusaders. They'll likely see each other. Well, they will see each other again when when the main six go evil. Oh yeah, evil. Oh yeah, I can't wait to talk about that one. Evil. So there's going to be a bunch of lemons. Well, some are considering the comic to be a big lemon. We shall tackle that in its own time. But I'm throwing that out there. And so now, let us move to our final thoughts on this here piece. Sapphire, have you managed to leave your bloodlust for Foskett's artwork behind? Slightly. Thestra like, was cute. Like I still cute. think that, that Mere Orca had no purpose in the comic and just got killed off for no reason. Yeah. That's, that's all I have. Mm-hmm. Norman, how about yourself? Well, as for me, this comic was an interesting one. I liked it for its story, but once you poke holes at it with the Miorca, oh god, why? What did Willy ever did to you? <laughs> but still, I find this comic pretty fun. It's a good read, and it shows the other side of Luna that we don't really see that much. And that skeleton scene, oh, that was freaky. <laughs> that was freaky. Freaky dicky. Yep. And other than that, the writing's not bad. I do like this. And I I enjoy this comic overall. It does a good view on Luna and the Crusaders, both getting to show their best. Luna trying to be an authority figure while wrestling with her own lack of confidence. The Crusaders showing their best by helping another pony. So many people seem to get upset if the comics feature a comic-exclusive character doing something. Suddenly it's a Mary Sue or Gary Stu stealing the spotlight from our heroines. But I think our heroines show their best when they're helping others. So if the comic exclusive characters give that opportunity, so much the better. Unfortunately, this comic falls into the trap of many a story. It assumes that our heroes are right by default. We're going to kill the Mirorca. Yay, we killed the Mirorca. We're heroes. We're champions. 
silver. You want to know something? That if that mirror card is Celestia's pet. <laughs> oh, oh, that'd be great. <laughs> Dang it, Luna! You killed Phil. You killed Phil Amina. Now you got. You went after Humphrey. <laughs> it's like, oh my god, <laughs> that would send her to the moon. <laughs> Or better, or better yet, that was Discord's poker buddy on Thursdays. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes. So there you go. You've you've taken an innocent life and deprived Celestia and Discord of a friend. Way to go, Luna. Uh, I could just imagine her saying "Huzzah!" Oh, it's just it. So basically, there's always those moments where. The show asks us to accept the ponies are in the right by default, and I like, no, I can't. You gotta show me. You gotta show me that, that their virtue is not just a give, a gimme. Mm-hmm. Honestly, the art for this one with the Miorca, I would like to see some teeth, like sharp fangs or whatever that is. Like, at least show some threat. Like, yeah, if that's there, that could have been, well, we could have automatically agreed that, oh, that is an evil creature. We must stop it. But nah, it was really cute. It was really cute. Like the mirror Arca could be a great art piece. Like, I don't know. I can somewhat imagine like some artistic inspiration with that. Oh, maybe, maybe you can make an art piece from its desiccated corpse. <laughs> no! Oh, no! No! Just arrange all the pieces. No, the mirror is beautiful. It's okay, babe. I still love you. <laughs> Maybe the parents are taking Thestral home and she, they're like, uh, honey, you've got little mirror shards in your hair. Oh, that's that's yeah. just my latest victim. Shows it off to the two bullies. See this? You're next. Oh, <laughs> uh, no. Oh, my. Anyway, Silver, next week's episode. <laughs> I just break you. Next week's episode. Well, let's see here. We covered Flutter Brutter mm-hmm. just recently. So I believe we are going to continue this trend, yes? Yes, next week's episode is going to be Season 6, Episode 12, overall episode number 129, Spice Up Your Life, yeah! Oh, and it's going to work, I know it's going to work, <laughs> Yeah, we're going to podcast just fine, you'll see. And it will go just fine, trust me. Famous last I'll words. Be, I'll be singing throughout most of this next podcast. I hope. I don't know. <laughs> oh, there you go. Are we going to randomly dance in a field of flowers and suddenly appear out of thin air? <laughs> well, here's what I know you need to see. I don't know where I'm going with this. I'll shut up now. No, but you do have a wonderful singing voice. Thank you. That's for next week. Meanwhile, we're we're all just going to hold a little memorial service for the Mirorca. <laughs> Take it for us before it's time. Oh, God, no. In the arms of an alicorn. <laughs> from here. Uh, Wait, so are alicorns actually dead? Apparently, apparently their hearts are. Oh, well. <laughs> but anywho, guys, thank you for joining us on this year MBS show. We will catch you next week. And in the meantime, I am the Silver Quill. I am Norman Senzo. I am Sapphire Hartsung. Saying adios. See ya. Bye bye. We need a sign that says free Mirorca. And let's send it off back into the night sky where it belongs. To a yes, galaxy sir. far, far away. We can't send it back where it's gone because it gets blown up. <laughs> it's all gone to pieces. <laughs>